Hi, in this video, what I want to do is talk about categorical syllogisms, and particularly how to figure out the mood and figure of a categorical syllogism and then how to look it up. And this is material that's covered in chapter 5.1. First, in terms of definitions, let's just remember that the minor term is the subject of the conclusion. The major term is the predicate of the conclusion. And the middle term is the term that occurs twice in the premises. Each term is going to occur twice throughout the syllogism. So the minor term will occur in the conclusion and in the minor premise. The major term will occur in the conclusion and in the major premise. And the middle term will occur in both the major and the minor premise. Now, of course, the major premise, then, is the premise with the major term. That is the premise with the conclusion, I'm sorry, the premise with the predicate of the conclusion. The minor premise is the premise with the minor term, or the premise with the subject of the conclusion. Standard form requires that we put it in this order. First, the major premise, second, the minor premise, and finally, the conclusion. The easy way to do this is first find the conclusion. Then look at the subject of the conclusion and make sure that's in the premise just above the conclusion. Then look at the predicate of the conclusion and make sure that's in the first premise. Okay? Major premise, minor premise, conclusion. That is standard form. It's very important that we have these syllogisms in standard form so that we can properly analyze them. Now, the mood is the letter for each premise in order going from the major premise to the minor premise to the conclusion. So once we have these in order, we name the letter for each premise and the conclusion. And remember, um, all R is A, no R is E, some R is I, and some R not is O. You remember that. So uh, that's from chapter 4. So all we have to do is name the letter for each statement. So let's look at this. What is the mood? We've got all P or M, some M or S, some S or P. And notice the predicate of the conclusion is in the first statement. All right. This is the major premise. This is the minor premise because it has the subject of the conclusion. The convention is to name the subject of the conclusion S when we don't know, the predicate of the conclusion P, and M is the middle term, which occurs twice. All right. Now, let's see if we can figure out the mood. And this might be a good time to pause and think about it if you want. Or um, if, if I could get copyright on Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, I'd play a little bit of his music to give you time to think. But um, hopefully by now you've figured out the mood by looking at the letter for this statement first, the letter for this statement second, and then the letter for this statement. So here's the mood. The answer is A-I-I. -I. All PRM, A statement. Some MRS, I statement. Some SRP is also an I statement. Okay, now we've got the mood. The figure is determined by the position of the middle terms, or the terms that occur twice in the premises. Now, this is the bad way to figure out figure. Figure 1, the middle term is the subject of the first premise and the predicate of the second. Figure 2, the middle term is the predicate of both. Figure 3, the middle term is the subject of both. Figure 4, the middle term is the predicate of the first and the subject of the second. Okay, you don't want to be carrying this around all the time. So what I'm going to do is refer you to refer you <laughs> to our textbook. So I'm going to get out of the PowerPoint and go to our textbook. All right, and this is on page 246. All right, and you can see figure one, uh, middle term is here and here. Figure two, it's predicate of both. Figure three, subject of both. And figure four, here and here. So um, remember, here, page 246, um, and that's going to be one of your best friends this semester, or at least for the next week or so. Now, another way to remember it that the authors of your text are actually, it's just one author, Hurley, although he's so 
um, amazing that uh, you want to see him almost as more than one author. You see that you know, figure one slopes down, figure four slopes up, and so he makes it like a shirt collar. Uh, so you can see the f how it looks a little bit like a shirt collar if you follow down, go up, this is the other collar, and up. And obviously this is someone tight-knit because the two middle terms are next to each other and, and so you know, they don't open up the shirt collar um, to expose you know, their disco chain and you know, whatever else uh, they have on underneath the collar. All right. In any case, we now can see where um, essentially the uh, figure is determined by the position of the middle term. All right. So let's go back to this. And let's see. So we've got our mood, right? AII. So let's look at the figure. What is the figure here? And remember, now we're looking at the position of the middle terms. And the answer is figure four. I might have jumped the gun a bit, but I'm sure you guys were looking. I'm hoping you pause. But notice that figure four, uh, we can see by looking at the middle terms. It's the predicate of the first statement, subject of the second. And so this is an AAI4. And um, I'll quit clicking this forward so I can explain more about this. So it's AII4. That's what it is. Now, how are we going to look up validity? Well, let's go back to our textbook. And um, let's look at the chart that is on page um, 247. And this is also, by the way, in the front cover of your book. I know you were wondering if the front cover was ever going to be useful, but here it is. So AII figure 4. Okay, we look under figure 4, AII is not there. Okay, so now we're going to go to conditionally valid forms. and We find that AII is also not there. So um, what that means is that AII figure 4 is invalid. Okay, AII figure 4 is invalid. One mistake that people make is they go and they try to find AII and they decide that it's got to be figure one because that's a valid one. But in this case, that is incorrect. It's AII figure four and that's invalid because we can't find it. All right? Now, in the next video, what I'm going to do is go over another example that will help you understand this a bit further. But for now, I'm hoping that um, you've been able to use this to determine the mood and figure and then how to look up the mood and figure on the chart. Until next time, goodbye. All right. I'm actually not going to say goodbye right now. I know, I faked you out. Uh, the tears were streaming down your cheeks because you were saying, you know, how can I um, go on? Um, actually, the st tears are streaming down my cheeks because I'm wondering how I can go on. Um, let's look at this slide for just a second. Um, we've got all dogs are mammals, all mammals are living things, some living things are dogs. And we're going to ask ourselves if it's valid. Okay? Uh, so we figure out the mood and figure, right? All are A, all are A. Some are I. A, A, I. Okay? The figure is determined by the position of mammals. Predicate, pred, uh, that subject, so it's A, A, I, figure four. Now, what am I doing here? Conditionally valid that P exists. Let's do this really quickly, if we can. And we'll go to the textbook again. All right, and we look. A, I, uh, I'm sorry, AAI, figure four, if we look, it's not here, but if we go down here under conditionally valid forms, figure four, AAI is here, which means it's, val it's valid from the Aristotelian, but not from the Boolean. With Aristotelian, we have to ask what would have to exist, and the required condition is that P exists. P is the predicate of the conclusion, which is dogs. Dogs exist. I know they exist because they lick me every morning, at least two of them, and therefore this is valid. So I'm hoping this helped with Chapter 5.